In the past, you've referred to value investors as a group of cod fishermen and suggested that they maybe fish in a different pond. Um, conversely, you've also discussed how over a long enough time frame, uh, an investor's realized return would mirror the business's return. So given that many of the highest quality businesses are in the US, uh, wouldn't some of our time uh, be best focused uh, analyzing the quality of the businesses uh, here in the US? And I understand that the odds offered on the bet matters a lot. So I'd be curious to hear in your mind how you um, weigh the quality of the horse versus the odds offered on the horse. Thank you. Well, both are important. But basically, all investment is, is value investment in the sense that you're always trying to get better prospects than you're paying for. And so, but you ha can't look everywhere at once, just any more than you could run a marathon in 12 different states at once. And so you have to have some system of picking some place to look, which is your hunting ground. But you're looking for value in every case. and. And what is interesting to me is you talk about the yes, I don't agree with you. I think the strongest companies are not in America. I think the Chinese companies are stronger than ours and they're growing faster. And I have investments in them and you don't. And, <laughs> and I'm right and you're wrong. Oh, that it really helps if you know which hunting ground to look in. In fact, we're, we all do better hunting and when we're hunting where the hunting is easy. I have a friend who's a fisherman. He says, I have a simple rule for success in fishing. Fish where the fish are. I had a question regarding uh, investing. With computers and artificial intelligence rapidly getting better at investing than humans, what should analysts and portfolio managers in the investment management industry do to remain competitive? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question. I think what people in the investment management industry ought to do is prepare for tougher times ahead. Everywhere I see the endowment managers have the same mantra. They want fewer and better investment managers. That's not going to be good for investment managers. And the rest of the people are indexing. Now, do you want any other cheery news? The cheery news is that if you think the way we nerds think and keep at it long enough, you'll do all right. But, but if, you, if you go with this crowd, I, I think there's pain ahead. Um, in the past, you've recommended index funds for most people seeking wealth accumulation. And in the past, Warren Buffett has recommended using the sell-off strategy for income as opposed to chasing dividends. If we synthesize those ideas, it seems like the best course of action for investing over a lifetime is to use index funds for accumulation and the sell-off strategy for income and retirement. Would you agree with that? And if so, what benefits do you see in using that strategy? Thank you. Well, I think the reason it's growing is that for most people, it does work better. And on the other hand, there's a huge proclivity to gamble. It's very interesting to play in a game where the returns are variable. And so there's a huge lure that comes to gambling. This is really stupid. It's hard to imagine, hard to imagine anything dumber. Uh, there's a great, anybody who's read your life, you're a testament to the idea that to not be a, a victim but to be a survivor. And it's an attitude that has helped me in my short uh, life so far. Could you perhaps expand on that idea, how it's helped you and how that is perhaps one of the greatest uh, ways to live your life out, regardless of what happens well, to you? Of course, feeling like, a, a, it's rather interesting to, to make change. Some people are victimized by other people. And if it weren't for the indignation that that causes, we wouldn't have reforms that we need. But that truth is mixed with another. It's very counterproductive for an individual to feel like a victim, even if he is. Best attitude is just to be cheerful about everything and keep plugging along. And therefore, I don't like politicians that get ahead by trying to make everybody else feel like a victim. And 
make my flesh crawl. And I just don't believe in it. Of course, who wants to be a victim instead of a survivor? Of course we want, and, but feeling like a victim, you can recognize your position has been trying to improve it, that's okay. But to have a deep feeling of victimhood and it's all somebody else's fault is a very counterproductive way to think. People don't even like being around it. It's really stupid. And yet our politicians build on it and try and make their careers work by doing something that's very bad for all the people they're talking to. And they think they're doing the world's work. Uh, the Daily Journal and Berkshire own a lot of the very large banks. I suspect many people in this room do. I know I do. It's kind of tailgating you and Mr. Buffett. Um, my question is concerning some of the um, fintech, fintech technologies coming up. Your position on crypto is very clear. But some of the other uh, fintech technologies, uh, my question is, do you see uh, them as being a threat to the long-term profitability of those large banks? Well, I don't know much about crypto technologies except to avoid them. I hate things like Bitcoin. I mean, I hate things that are intrinsically antisocial. Of course, we need real currencies. And one of the interesting things about the current condition is that the Americans have created the reserve by accident, have created the reserve currency of the world. And the world needs a reserve currency. And I don't sense any great sense of trusteeship among my fellow Americans for behaving very well in our responsibilities to the rest of the world with our own currency. Our attitude is we'll do what pleases us. That's not my view. I think once you get a big responsibility to other people who are depending on you, you ought to think about them too. Uh, we have record uh, uh, record budget deficits, record unemployment, and uh, record expansion of the balance sheet. Why do you think we don't have uh, inflation? And secondly, could you recommend some good books you've read the last year? Well, regarding inflation, you know, the economists of the world thought they knew a lot more than they did. What has happened is weird that in response to the Great Recession, all the nations of the world have printed money like crazy and have bought all kinds of investment assets. And they've done things that nobody in the economics profession would have recommended on this scale even five or so years ago and yet the inflation has been very low. I think we all have a lot to be modest about when we talk about economics. Lyndon Johnson said that giving a talk on economics was a lot of pissing down your leg. He said it feels, feels hot to you, but it doesn't influence anybody else very much. I, I wanna ask you about Tesla. Uh, the company has a market capitalization of about $140 billion. It traded last week about $200 billion in stock and traded about $500 billion in options. And the stock moved about 20% a day. Meanwhile, Mr. Musk seems thrilled uh, to stoke this volatility. Um, I wanted to know what your thoughts are on this situation uh, and particularly what your thoughts are on Mr. Musk's behavior. My thoughts are two. I would never buy it and I would never sell short. I have a third comment. There was a man out in Los Angeles for years named Howard Amundsen. He once said something that I've taken to my heart. He said, never underestimate the man who overestimates himself. I think Elon Musk is peculiar and he may overestimate himself, but he may not be wrong all the time. Any secret of longevity and um, how many hours do you work a day? How do you stay like so current with all the information? Like a lifelong learner? Well, I don't think I deserve any credit for longevity. It just happened. I don't have any. There's no male in my family that ever lived any such age. And it's weird. I, I can't help you. <laughs>
For over $10 trillion of securities around the world with a negative yield, and by the president's Twitter feed, it seems that he wants to bring negative interest rates to the United States. Are you for negative interest rates or against them? Negative interest rates make me very nervous. However, I don't think the authorities had much choice. It's politically impossible to do big stimulus rapidly. And the only weapon they had in a crisis was to print money and, and, and change interest rates. And I think it was probably the right thing to be done. Of course, it makes me nervous. I think having worked once, people will overdo it. And that's the nature of governments and people. And of course, that makes me nervous. I don't know what to do about this. I came to your meeting back in the 80s. I think we had 25 or 30 people at your at your annual meeting. Uh, the question I have, with the deficit so high, with interest rates, is the interest rates in more of a bubble situation? And I remember back in the 70s, we had the Nifty 50. Is our technology stocks in the same criteria as, we, as it is now? As a, as a, as a, it looks like there's 10, 15 stocks everybody's investing. The value situation has been down for the last four or five years. I was also looking at a couple of stocks that you own, Kraft Foods, but you're 26 uh, percent in the company. How come? Uh, is it makes sense to for your company to, for Berkshire Hathaway to buy out Kraft Food completely and take advantage of a low price? Well, I don't think I can comment about what Berkshire Hathaway might do next, or what price. But Nifty 50 is an interesting question. At the height of the Nifty 50 craziness, which was created by the Morgan Bank of all places, had a home sewing company who was selling her 50 times earnings. Home sewing, great God. We are not that crazy yet. I don't think that, I think that a lot of what's happened is not crazy. I, I think these companies are very valuable. Well, they may be selling at too high prices, but home sewing was sure to fail. I don't think our leading tech companies are at all sure to fail. Well, I think it's not nearly, the current situation is not nearly as crazy as what Nifty 50 was absolute dementia. Just wanted to ask you a quick question about uh, the fact that you were an early proponent of electric vehicles, specifically um, your investment in BYD. I wonder if from your perspective today, uh, other technologies like hydrogen fuel cells or others that may come to mind are equally important in terms of their emerging uh, capabilities and what sort of impact they may have. Well, I think electric vehicles will be more popular than hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells. Getting the sun's energy transferred into electricity and electricity into the vehicles is basically a good idea for the long haul. And I think all the technology is going to work. And some of it's actually improving. We may get a lithium battery that's actually quite safe and more energetic than most we have now. And, and uh, well, I, th I, think, I think that's all to the good. When I came to California, we had a petroleum club. We had wildcatters. We had a little big oil industry. It's a little like Texas. I don't think we found any new oil to speak of in California in decades. I think it's dangerous to rely on hydrocarbons for, for energy. Of course, we've got to take more of it directly from the sun. There's a lot of talk these days about the climate and the environment um, and funds divesting fossil fuels and countries trying to figure out how to generate electricity without polluting the environment. Could you give us your thoughts on, on nuclear power? I know uh, Bill Gates has been a pretty vocal supporter of it. And I read that uh, Warren used to invest in uranium back in the 50s. And, you know, he more recently helped fund uh, a uranium bank in Central Asia. So if you had any comments on that as well, thank you. Well, I admire Bill Gates, who feels the duty to throw money at stuff that's unpopular elsewhere and it might possibly work. Oh, I think 
That's an admirable charitable effort by Bill Gates and one for which he's very well suited. I don't know whether we're going to get safe little atom plants or something, but I think it's certainly worth thinking about. The problem with it, of course, is that additional material do you want a bunch of crazy humans to have? And I don't know the answer to that question. So my question is on universal basic income. So it is a governmental public program for a periodic payment delivered to everyone without any work requirement. So I'm just curious about your opinion on a plan like this. Thank you. Well, if you did enough of it, you'd totally ruin everything. <laughs> Little of it we can afford. What the exact mix is, we'll be determining through the political process forever. You talk frequently about having the moral imperative to be rational. And yet, as humans, we're constantly carrying this evolutionary baggage which gets in the way of us thinking rationally. Are there any tools or behaviors you embrace to, to facilitate your rational thinking? The answer is, of course. I hardly do anything else. And one of my favorite tricks is the inversion process. And I'll give you an example. When I was a meteorologist in World War II. They told me how to draw weather maps and predict the weather. What we're actually doing is clearing pilots to take flights. And you just reverse the problem. I inverted. I said, suppose I wanted to kill a lot of pilots. What would be the easy way to do it? And I soon concluded that the only easy way to do it would be to get the planes into icing the planes couldn't handle, or to get the pilot into a place where he'd run off fuel before he could safely land. So I made up my mind I was going to stay miles away from killing pilots by, by either icing or getting them into socked in conditions when they couldn't land. I think that helped me be a better meteorologist in World War II. I just reversed the problem. And if somebody hired me to fix India, I would immediately say, what could I do if I really wanted to hurt India? And I'd figure out all the things that would most easily hurt India, and then I'd figure out how to avoid them. Now, you'd say it's the same thing, it's just in reverse. But it works better to frequently to invert the problem. If you're a meteorologist, it really helps if you really know how to avoid something, which is the only thing that's going to kill your pilot. And it, it, it's constantly avert. You don't think of what you want, you think what you want to avoid. Or when you're thinking what you want to avoid, you also think about what you want. And you just go back and forth all the time. Peter Kaufman, who's here today, he likes the idea that you want to know how the world looks from the top looking down, and you want to know what it looks like from the bottom looking up. If you don't have both points of view, your reality recognition is lousy. Uh, I have a question about, uh, you know, if you were researching a new company that you've never heard of, um, how would you approach the research process? How much time would you spend if you performed an intrinsic value estimate and the company was expensive, would you still continue following the company closely and, and researching it, or do you kind of try to get to evaluation pretty quickly, and if it's, if it's not cheap, kind of move on. How do you balance the time you spend on companies? I want to think about things where I have an advantage over other people. I don't want to play a game where the other people have an advantage over me. Well, if you have a pharmaceutical company and you're trying to guess what new drug is going to be invented, I've got no advantage. Other people are better than that than I am. I don't play in a game where the other people are wise and I'm stupid. I look for a place where I'm wise and they're stupid. And believe me, it works better. And I, and I, I you have to know the edge of your own competency. You have to kind of know what, this is too tough for me. I'll never figure this out. I'm very good at knowing when I can't handle something. Uh, I'm Arimon, I'm, I'm a student at USC. And I uh, just had a quick question. Um, 
you know, I'm 18 right now. I'm in college, and sometimes I, I lose interest in what I do. Uh, and you're 96, and you're so passionate about what you do. Um, so, what what keeps you going? Like, what is your? How do you still have the motivation? Thank you. Well, maybe I've been lucky. I like what I do. I have wonderful partners and friends. I have a nice family. My problems are interesting to me. I have been a very fortunate man. I don't know how to make everybody else lucky. I could have had a different hand and been some miserable alcoholic throwing up in the gutter. It's, it, I don't think I deserve any great credit for having stumbled into a reasonable amount of publicity. I do think that trying to be rational helped. That's the only thing you've got if you're a fellow nerd. There's no point in your... If you're not going to be a sex object, you may have to rely on your rationality. Over the years, you've shared lots of comments about India and China. I would love to hear any and all insights you have about your friendly neighbors to the north, whether it's our Canadian political system, banking system, housing sector, resources industry, healthcare system, any and all insights, wisdom on Canada would be much appreciated. Well, I'm glad you gave me this opportunity. I'm very partial to Canada, and I think their socialized medicine system work is, I think they're wise to have it. And I think they're wise to pay their pharmaceutical prices instead of ours. Uh, and I think it's wonderful that we've gotten along with Canada so well all these years. And, and I, I think you should be quite pleased with Canada. I don't think it helped you to have two different languages spoken. It was an unfortunate accident.